So what I'm going to talk about today is really the question of whether animal and human communication systems are the same kind of thing or different kinds of things. This is a really old question. It goes back uh, well before Darwin, but Darwin really crystallized it. So in The Origin of the Species, he has a discussion where he's asking the question of, do we humans just have more of what animals already have? So, you know, dogs bark and monkeys squeal and do we just do that except we just do it more because we're cleverer. And there's another, there's, not, there's an alternative idea which is no we're just different. So the way we're set up is different. It's not that we've got more intellectual oomph than other animals, which we do probably, but it's just that we're also set up quite differently. So this is, this is the question I want to talk about and there's some really interesting evidence I think in a way that leads us down the second line, that is that we're set up differently. It's not so much that we are just cleverer, there's something about us that makes us different as far as language goes. So, um, uh, I mean, the idea, this idea that we're set up differently has kind of gone through cycles in the science of linguistics over time. So there was a period, if we think about sounds, for example, there was a period uh, back in the 50s and 60s where people, um, discovered that human beings have this, this capacity to take streams of sound and to cut them into discrete bits, right? So when, when I say the, the difference between, say, uh, a ta and a da, the big difference between those two sounds is not where they're made in the mouth, but actually the fact that my voice box switches on and starts buzzing a bit earlier in da than in ta. Okay, there's other things going on as well in English, but that's the big difference, that's the main difference, and that's called the onset of voicing. So it used to be thought, when this was sort of discovered, it was discovered that even little babies could detect the onset of voicing difference, and they made a sharp split between the D sound and the T sound. And the way they tested this is what they did was they, um, they used speech synthesizers. This was back in the 50s and 60s. They used speech synthesizers and they just changed the, like incrementally when the onset of the voice starts. So, you know, they'd essentially say, they'd, they'd play a uh, ta and then they'd move the voicing a bit further into the sound. So it would sound a bit more like da and then it'd be very into the sound. So it'd be like da. Right? And they did that like in tiny, tiny incremental bits. And what they found with the babies is that even really young babies, they just make a sharp split. They, they, they hear it as ta, then they hear it as da. And that's how all human languages work. So everyone was like, wow, you know, like humans, we're so special. And then um, uh, there was a famous experiment done by Kuhl and Miller, and they showed that actually we're not that special. Chinchillas can do this. So what they did was they trained chinchillas uh, and uh, they trained them, first of all, to recognise the clear difference between D and T. Okay? Then they did the same kind of experiment. They incremented with the speech synthesizer. They incremented where the voice starts. And they wanted to see whether the chinchillas would notice a sharp difference or if they would just sort of see it was just a, prob you know, like a statistical thing, right? And uh, they did it in quite a horrible way. They, like, you know, they'd play duh, duh, duh to the chinchillas. And then, first of all, what they do is they make the chinchillas really thirsty. They put water over the end of the cage. And then they'd say da, da, da. And the chinchillas would run over and get the water and be very happy. But sometimes they would say ta. And the chinchillas would start off going and then they would electrocute the chinchillas' feet. It's pretty horrible, right? But what it did was it made the chinchillas recognise that if they hear ta, they're not going to run over. And if they hear da, they are. So they taught them that. And then they did this thing with the speech synthesizer. And they just incrementally moved things forward a little bit. And they discovered that chinchillas, just like babies, they make a sharp distinction. So we thought way back in the 50s that maybe we discovered something special about humans. This idea that humans make a categorical language split between sounds. A big, you know, two different categories, a t versus a d, a p versus a b, a k versus a g, and so on. But actually it turns out that chinchillas can do it, rats can do it, monkeys can do it, lizards can do it, snakes can do it. Virtually everyone can do this. So it's not remotely a special human. So you might think Darwin was right then, right? So it is just that, like, we use this in a kind of more clever way than other animals, but other animals can do it too. So that was one big thing that looked like, you know, kind of one goal for the Darwin side. Um, so uh, 
So there's other cases that Darwin picked up on where animals also seem to have a capacity to use not so much sounds like we do, but words. So if you think about, you know, you, you say to your dog or whatever, sit, run, and the dog can learn a few English words or Russian words or whatever language. Um, and there's some, there's a, there's a very famous case uh, where basically the, where basically dogs, there's a dog called Rico, who's a border collie, and they taught him hundreds of words that you could learn. And you might think, ah, so maybe it is just that we as, uh, as humans, we have the same capacity as a dog or a monkey or something like that to learn distinct words. But actually what happens is uh, we just have more oomph there. And, uh, and it's certainly the tr case that we have more oomph because human babies learn hundreds of words a day, or well, not hundreds a day, 10 a day, hundreds a month. We learn about 10,000 words over a lifetime and animals never really get more than a couple of hundred. So there's some big difference there. So that was, that's another thing where you might think, oh, you know, Darwin, maybe Darwin was right here. Darwin's a clever guy, so maybe he was right. But I think the big blow that shows that he wasn't right is, uh, is not in sounds and not really in words, but it's really in grammar. It's in the capacity to put words together and create meaningful, meaningful sentences out of them. So we do this all the time. I'm doing it right now. I'm saying quite complex things. I'm getting over quite complex ideas to you and I'm doing it effortlessly. Uh, well, maybe it's not so effortless, but you know, it's very easy for me to put all these words together and to say what I mean. No other animal is anywhere near that. So there was some debate in the 60s and 70s and early 80s uh, with apes, which are our closest relatives genetically. Um, so Kanzi, who's a very famous ape, uh, who's a bonobo, um, there was a lot of claims made for Kanzi, who uh, was uh, worked with by um, a woman called Susan Savage Rumbo, and she argued that Kanzi could actually put words together and you know, create new meanings out of the words that he put together. Um, Generally, people don't think that that's true anymore. And part of the reason they don't think it's true is because actually what Savage Rumble did was quite clever. She got Kanzi to do some stuff. She would use these things called lexigrams, which are like words. And she would get Kanzi to, to you know, understand the lexigrams in sequences and go and do stuff with them, you know, put a ball in a basin or whatever. And she'd go like, look, well, that's amazing. I can show Kenzie these lexigrams and he can put the ball in the basin. And she got a young child, Aaliyah, I think she was called at the time, and Aaliyah could do the same kind of thing. And so Savage Rumble said, well, look, Kenzie's got like the grammatical skills of a three-year-old child. But actually there's the linguist called Rob, Tr Rob Truswell at Edinburgh, and he's looked very carefully at all of the data that Savage Rumble put together and uh, he's, he's taken out examples where he's coordinated two things. So he'll say something like, you know, put the ball and the orange in the cup or something like that, right? And Kenzi, the bonobo, just doesn't know what to do, right? Doesn't understand that ball and orange is a single chunk, it's a single grammatical unit and that's what's to be put in the cup. So sometimes Kenzi will put the orange in, sometimes the ball, sometimes just wander away and do nothing. Aaliyah, at the same time, the three-year-old kid, she gets it right virtually all the time. So it looks like Aaliyah has actually quite a different linguistic capacity from Kanzi. What it looks like Kanzi's really doing is he's attending to the sequence of things and he's really, he's understood that the sequence matters, but because of these examples where you're sticking two things together in the sequence, you're saying put the ball and the orange in the cup, where the ball and the orange is a single grammatical unit, Kanzi can't understand that. He can't understand that there's a, there's a hierarchy to the sentence. He only sees the sequence. Now Aaliyah, who's the human child, she's three years old, but she gets the fact that the language is organized like a hierarchy straight off. So that's really quite interesting because that shows that Kanzi, who's clearly very clever, he's as clever as a three-year-old child in many, many other respects, uh, um, and he can, he's got a real incredible proficiency with language, right? He's learned hundreds, like 500, I think it is, of these signs for things, these lexigrams, and he's able to understand sequences, but he just can't get the hierarchy. And the hierarchy is what's at the heart of human language. The hierarchy is the, the thing that allows us to create meanings in, uh, in kind of almost, almost unbounded ways. So we can put 
uh, elements together and then we can put we create a single chunk we can put that together with something else create a larger chunk and then we can do just what I'm doing right now which is just speaking and speaking and speaking and probably I'm speaking too long now right um, and, and animals we've not found a single animal that can do anything like that there's another really interesting case where actually it looks that like animals have can do stuff with language but it it, they can do things with language in another, in a quite different way than uh, than humans can. So this is the case. Um, it's worked by Juan Toro, who's in Barcelona, and it, he compares rats, who you might not think are the most linguistic of creatures, and babies, and he shows that rats are better at certain linguistic tasks than babies are, better than human babies. Uh, so the the particular task is actually trying to under trying to see whether rats can learn a specific rule of a sequence of syllables. So what he shows, what he does is he looks at um, examples like um, uh, dagare, uh, numuze, uh, luguba, right? Where if you think about those, you've got the same vowel, the same vowel, and then a different vowel, right? So all, so, so the rat or the child can essentially learn, be exposed to lots of cases like that, and then will learn the actual difference, right? We'll, we'll go like, oh, so when the rat or the child hears a different pattern, we'll go, oh, what was that, right? So rats can do that, kids can do that. But what kids can't do is uh, do something when you've got the same consonants, if you've got a pattern of the consonants. So for example, if you had something like da du na, or ge go re, or li lo ma, or something like that, where you've got the same consonant, same consonant, then a different consonant, the kids just break. They just can't do it. The rats, however, can learn the rule. So it, tur so it turns out that you might think, oh my god, rats are actually better at language than babies are in some case. So that's kind of like, Darwin was not right. What was going on here? But actually, it's really interesting, because if you look at human languages, we know of many human languages that create rules by messing around with the vowel sounds. So the Semitic languages work like this, Hebrew, Arabic, Tigrinya, and so on. What they do is they change the tense of verbs or they turn verbs into nouns by changing the vowel patterns, but not by changing the consonant patterns. We don't know of any language like that's like the inverse of Hebrew, that where you would change the consonant patterns and the, the vowels would be the word, and you mess around with the consonant patterns to make it past tense or future tense. And that seems, so it seems that in some weird and interesting way, we human beings have a limited capacity to do certain things with the structures of language and that limited capacity we have it's not just looking at statistical patterns it's something very special to us and that's something that we can see actually happening in the languages we speak which I think means that Darwin in the end was wrong <laughs> that is humans have something that's just quite different from what animals have it's not that we're more clever it's just that we're differently clever